hope everybody's having a great day. We're having a lot of good food, good conversation, um, good networking. And I wanted to quickly thank again our sponsors um, with a couple of gifts. We usually do this for all of our um, sponsors that are coming out, so I just want to name them again and remind you, we have both Magenic at the back left and then Matt Wynn from P1. Matt, can you wave your hand? I was talking great things about him earlier today, um, and I want everybody to be able to go say hi. And then at Magenic, we have Sean, uh, Adrian, and uh, Dan all here. So I, I want to ask one of each of the uh, representatives for the groups as well as uh, one of the ones from AP, AP, APG and Google. So Matt, can I have you come up real quick? Matt, come on up. So again, Matt is with um, P1 Technologies, a great firm out of uh, El Segundo. They have a tech summit next week um, in Hermosa Beach, I believe. They would love to have a few of you there. If any of you are interested, come say hi to Matt. Matt, thank you so much. Here's your gift. Thanks, Charles. The label. The label. Oh, oh. Yeah, I got it. Matt. Thanks, thank you. Charles. Appreciate it. All right. So next up, we're going to have Magenic. Can I have Sean from Magenic, if he's still here? There we go. Again, I've been, I've been talking with Magenic for almost a year now, all great conversations. They're, they're a good date. They, they took me out to a couple of games, so it, it's definitely been a fun conversation. Thank you. And then finally, our platinum sponsor today. Um, is going to be Google, and Apogee with Google. We have Chris coming up, who's going to be speaking. Um, but if, where do we have Chris? Oh, I lost you. Yeah, so we have Chris Hood, um, the global digital advisor for Apogee. Um, and if you could come up, I'm going to leave the present for you. And then hand off the mic, and it's all you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hold on one moment. That's got you set up with your over here. Yeah. A little coordination for us. Good. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I wanted just to say thank you for the sponsorship. Appreciate being here today. Hopefully everybody is having a great time. As we said, my name is Chris Hood. I am uh, a global value advisor as part of our customer success team. And uh, I'm gonna just take a couple of minutes to talk about innovation, since that seems to be our topic for today, right? So let's kind of, you ready? Technical difficulties. That's me. <laughs> next. Yeah, next slide. You good? Okay. So, you know, while I've been listening to uh, today's sessions this morning, um, you know, I really couldn't help but think about all of the opportunities that are in front of us right now. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're all excited to get back to your offices and start to put some information into uh, effects to create new digital journeys. Uh, and that's part of what we are here about. Now, innovation is a great topic. It's often seen as a competitiveness for your products, your processes, and your people. And this is even more true in an era today of continuous change and intense competition where the longevity of our products is slowly deteriorating and automation has become basically essential and customers have higher demands. So how do we keep up? How do we innovate in a way that is continuous, adaptive, and meaningful? One approach that I'm sure most of you have probably heard recently is around merging APIs. Now, building APIs from an API-first mindset, focused on an outside-in perspective, 
and using those to help you transform your organization and drive new business value is really what Apogee is all about. But APIs have essentially now become glue for innovation. Yes, APIs. And if you don't know what APIs are, Application Programming Interfaces, APIs. You know, the more I think about it, I don't really agree with this definition. Application Programming Interfaces. It really sounds too technical, and honestly, it doesn't capture the essence of meaningful and continuous innovation. If we are truly looking at APIs to help us drive our business forward, while also building differentiators for our products, processes, and people, we should probably start looking at APIs in a new way. What if we change things up a little bit? Here's an option. How about if we say application product interfaces? Being able to build products and new digital experiences is essential in business today. An example of this is Philips. They are a global technology company that has developed a smart lighting platform for their Hue connected lights. Some of you may have them in your homes. And you can fully control those lights through a smartphone app using APIs. Philips took the approach to let their engineers, the engineers, focus on product development rather than managing technical in integrations. The productization of their APIs now supports over 25 million lighting requests a day. But APIs, how about one more? How about application process? interface. Streamlining innovation by using a platform with tools that allow your company be, to be more nimble might be a good way to look at the value of APIs. Pitney Bowes is a hundred-year-old company that is best known for developing postage meters. They discovered that leveraging Apogee they were able to reduce their time to market for new application development from 18 months to four months. As a result, Pitney Bowes looks at APIs as an entirely new line of business. Continuous process improvement using APIs was how they innovated. But one more, let's look at one more example. How about application people interfaces. Strong businesses link every decision back to improving their value proposition. And in my experience, APIs deliver the most value when serving as an interface between a company and people. Consider a company like Domino's Pizza. They thrive on developing new mechanisms for their customers to place orders. They have over 20 different ways to order pizza now, and it generates 65% of all of their sales. And that's all going through their API platform. The company relentlessly looks at the ever-changing demands of people and quickly innovates new technologies with APIs. Their goal is simple, interface their business with people. In each of these examples, the key is to understand that innovation does not need to be revolutionary. You must learn how to fail faster, then iterate so you can innovate sooner. When you return to your offices tomorrow, find the opportunities that allow your organization to evolve, to quickly work on new ideas, to keep up with the changing markets, and to iterate towards innovation. The Apogee team is here, over here, wave your hand. And in the back, we've got a table. We're happy to hear, be here to uh, talk to you. If you have questions, we'd like to hear about your digital journeys, whatever the case. 
Thank you again. Appreciate it. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone has enjoyed it today, all the wonderful speakers and presentations, and I hope everyone stays and continues uh, to enjoy the rest of the day. Piper O'Brien, I'm an active board member on Innovate UCLA, and um, I'm super excited to announce our next speaker, Dr. Hiro Ono. Uh, some of you may have heard of him or some of the things that uh, he's doing, and he works with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, known as JPL. He's going to take us on a journey on how him and his team use machine learning and AI to enable rovers, uh, what we know as space robots, to be more intelligent while exploring Mars. So everyone, please, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Hiro Ono. Thanks for introduction. Um, I'm Hiro Ono at JPL. I'm going to talk about the, uh, how JPL uses AI and machine learning for space exploration. Well, there are many ways to use it, right? The, um, it's not singular. But probably, or arguably, one of the most important applications of AI and machine learning in space is to automate the spacecraft. So um, I want to present, before going into what comes next in the future, I want to talk a little bit about a brief history about spacecraft autonomy. Why? Because sometimes, you know, um, the best way to predict the future is not to look at the state of the art, but to look back and what innovations drove um, the uh, state of the um, technology up to here. So, um, looking at the uh, history of spacecraft autonomy, of course, you know, AI and ML a very really strong tool to make the spacecraft self-independent, right? So I'm gonna plot a curve here. Uh, this is the uh, time. The vertical axis is the level of autonomy. What curve do you guys expect? Going up, going down. Very interestingly, um, the early spacecrafts are 100% autonomous simply because they didn't have receivers, right? So it was simple and fully autonomous. And there was a disruptive innovation here named digital computer, right? That allowed us to command the spacecraft. So the spacecraft got manual, right? Um, you know, this chart is somewhat uh, quantitative. I don't know when we hit the bottom, but uh, um, the modern spacecrafts are mostly manual, with autonomy plays supporting, but very important role. But, you know, as we are discussing again and again today, there are ongoing innovations that are gonna bring back the uh, level of autonomy back to, I won't say 100%, but uh, uh, make it more autonomous and more capable. So, um, the earliest spacecrafts uh, I guess uh, you guys know Explorer 1. Um, this is the first US satellite that the JPL created. Um, that is essentially a flying sensor. There's no computer, there's no memory storage. The sensors, which in this case Geiger counters, was directly connected to transmitter. So you receive the radio signal from the spacecraft. That's the current reading of the sensor. That was it. Pioneer 4, this might be uh, uh, less uh, famous than the uh, Explorer 1, but this is the first US spacecraft to escape the gravity of Earth. And the mission was to, um, to um, measure the radiation um, environment around the moon, as well as to take the first picture of it. Uh, which was not successful, actually. Um, so it's a bit more complicated than the mission of Explorer 1, but still it was fully autonomous. For example, uh, it has to de-spin um, to take a picture. Um, to do so, there is a hydraulic timer. 
uh, such that uh, uh, the D-spin yo-yo mechanism is deployed exactly 10 hours later. It's not computer, it was hydraulic. Um, there was a photoelectric sensors, essentially uh, you know, two pixel uh, CCD, um, but uh, it rotates, so it scans the um, you know, surface of the, um, the moon as it spins, right? Um, and to take the picture at the right time, uh, we are not sending the command. Uh, this spacecraft was supposed to be triggered by the light of the moon. However, unfortunately, um, because of some failures in launch, the, it uh, uh, passed too far from the moon, so uh, the sensor was not triggered, and it couldn't take a picture. Um, the then, um, so, you know, um, one very fortunate um, thing happened to space exploration was that the advent of digital computer coincided with rocket. Right, so uh, when we first got the um, digital computer that can be put on board, there were two schools of thought about how to use it for space, okay? One needs to use it to fully automate it and make it more complex, right? So um, there was actually a 1959 proposal of Mars probe by MIT Draper Lab. Then it was called Instrumentation Lab. The proposed mission was as follows. It's gonna send a probe to a free return trajectory to Mars, fly by Mars, take just a one picture, just a single picture of Mars, come back to the Earth, and drop the film in a capsule. Amazing, right? Nowadays, all spacecraft just you know, send the data back by radio. Uh, but actually, <clears throat> The uh, spy satellites in the 1950s, 60s, were also dropping films in a the capsule. They didn't send by radio, because uh, there's no trans, uh, you know, encryption. Um, anyways, so uh, it was advertised as totally self-dependent machine. What's notable was that the navigation uh, was designed to be autonomous. Navigation being, you know, uh, knowing its um, position precisely in the space, and the plan was to uh, make an onboard observation of the Earth, Mars, Sun, and triangulate um, to find its own place and make an auto automated trajectory correction maneuver by computer. So this proposal didn't materialize, unfortunately, but this work resulted in the Apollo guidance computer that was the central piece that enabled the um, human landing on the moon. So. The other school of thought about how to use digital computer is to enable the commanding from the Earth. Um, where, you know, we call command sequencing. Uh, it's basically, you know, um, we are not communicating to the spacecraft all the time, right? We dump the sequence of commands to the spacecraft. And the computer stores the command and execute them at a specified time, which is impossible without digital computer. So um, the enabling technologies uh, was, you know, as I said repeatedly, it was solid state digital computer. Solid state digital computer, which is a bit unfamiliar, right? Why solid state? Because these days, computers were mostly vacuum tube made, right? And transistors were new innovations at this time. Solid state meaning that computer using transistors. You know, you don't want to bring the uh, 100 or 1,000 vacuum tubes to the space. Um, Two-way communication, that's also an enabler for quantum sequencing, and of course, onboard data storage. So um, the pioneering work uh, of the Earth-based control of the spacecraft is in Ranger 1 and 2 spacecrafts that were made by JPL back in 1960, and that was unfortunately not successful, but we were successful uh, in commanding the spacecraft in the Ranger 3 and Mariner 2 missions. Mariner 2 was the world's first um, spacecraft to visit another pl planet, Venus. Then it came to the age of modern spacecrafts, which are less autonomous. Uh, autonomy, or AI, whatever you call it, plays 
more marginal role, but still it's a critical component. It's basically used um, for the part of the mission that cannot be uh, remotely controlled from the ground. For example, uh, in case of Voyager 2, there was a, a, a fold recovery logic implemented on its computer, and actually that saved the mission. You know, Voyager 2, if you know about it, uh, it that, that is the only spacecraft visited Uranus and Neptune. And actually, uh, the Neptune flyby in 1989, I was six years old, and that was the, uh, my life-changing moment. I was watching the TV in Tokyo back in Japan, and oh, this is something that I want to do uh, when I grow up. Um, anyways, so um, right after the Voyager 2 was launched, um, uh, the primary receiver failed. Then the onboard computer detected the fault and auto autonomously switched to the, um, the backup receiver. You know, it's a simple if-then rule, so it's not comparable to modern AI, but still, you know, that's a, a great uh, success story about the autonomy. Mars lander and rovers, um, there is what we call seven minutes of terror. Okay, meaning that you know, uh, we typically do direct entry to Mars atmosphere. So when spacecraft hits the top of the atmosphere, uh, then it, it, it only has seven minutes uh, till it lands. And between them, it has to you know, deploy the parachute, and you have to um, you know, fire the uh, little, uh, little rocket and precisely land on the location. And because it's only seven minutes, and the time delay between Mars and Earth is typically 20, 30 minutes at the time of landing, so there's no way that we can remotely control, right? So there's no option than as automated. We, we've been doing this for many times. And actually, um, JPL so far is the only institution, actually, actually NASA, because they're a Viking probe. NASA is the only um, institution in the world who has successfully landed things on Mars yet. So um, there are, you know, as I said, new prospects for space on AI these days. Um, one of the major bottleneck for automating spacecrafts uh, had been and has been the uh, weak computation power on board. The um, computer that the uh, Mars 2020 rover that's going to be launched next year, as well as Curiosity rover that is still driving on Mars, is RAD 750. That is the space version of PowerPC 750. Do you guys remember this Mac? Yeah? It's the same CPU that uh, this uh, uh, cute computer had. It's a single core, of course. 100 or 200 megahertz. Um, it's much less than what you have in your pocket cell phone. But we are looking at the new uh, computation, uh, upgrading the onboard computation. One of the efforts is called HPSC, High Performance Spacecraft Computing. That's a joint venture between NASA and Air Force and to create a modern uh, multi-core ARM processor with core processors. We are also looking at using commercial off-the-shelf products, for example, Qualcomm Snapdragon. And actually, I'm gonna talk about it later on, but uh, we're gonna fly a helicopter on Mars in 2021, piggybacked on Mars 2020 rover. The helicopter uses Snapdragon on board. So um, given this, um, we, are, we have now a renewed interest in spacecraft auto autonomy for many reasons. Uh, the reason number one is, of course, for enhancing productivity and safety, right? We, we want to make spacecraft more capable and safer um, to, to, to um, collect information on other planets. Uh, second um, reason is that uh, we want to overcome the limitations in communication. You know, communication between uh, space and Earth, the capacity is limited by the law of physics. But now the spacecraft can, is capable of collecting more and more data. So actually now uh, we can collect significantly more data than it can send back, right? So uh, how to overcome it? One, one way to do so is not to send all the data back, but do the analysis on board. 
Uh, the third reason, um, for some destinations, we need to quickly complete the mission. For example, on Europa, I'm gonna talk about it later, we only have tens of days because radiation will quickly cook your spacecraft. On Venus, uh, the temperature is a few hundred degrees. Uh, your spacecraft got, again, cooked quickly uh, in a few hours. So in order to complete your mission within this short time horizon, again, you need to automate everything. And finally, uh, we want to boldly go where no man has gone before, right? Um, for example, underground cave systems on Mars and Moon, there is subsurface ocean in Europa and Enceladus and Titan, or we may want to go KBO in terra space or maybe Alpha Centauri. Okay, so uh, from here, I'm gonna um, speak uh, um, a few um, specific examples about uh, near and far future missions, potential missions uh, that I am involved. The first thing that I, I, I want to introduce is Mars 2020 rover that will be launched next year. Um, and this picture, this is the uh, landing site of Mars 2020 called Jezero Crater. Can you guess why we want to go there? Right? Uh, it was because, it's because this crater, which is about uh, 50 kilometer uh, in uh, diameter, that was a lake in four billion years ago. And to the lake, so uh, actually this is the rim of the crater which goes like this, excuse me. So there were rivers flowing into the lake, one from the west, one from the north, and there's a beautiful delta preserved in this crater. And delta, having delta means, you know, the river in four billion years ago, collected all these soils and rocks and just dump everything here. So scientists think that this is the, the, the most likely place that you can find the evidence of an ancient life on Mars, if existed. So um, going back to the technical uh, aspect, um, Mars 2020 gonna have a highly capable autonomous driving but actually, we've been driving on Mars autonomously for 15 years. And actually, you know, um, back in 2004, the 100% vehicles on Mars were, uh, were capable of self-driving. Of course, 100% being just two out of two. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, why we want to um, do the autonav, right? Um, as I said, um, you know, once you landed, you know, you have plenty of time, so you can manually drive, but um, we cannot continuously communicate to, to Mars. Typically, we, all, we have uh, only one chance in a day, margin day, to talk to the rover. So the way that we control the rover manually is that the rover takes the 360 panorama on the day before, and humans on Earth at JPL plan the path. Right? Uh, however, of course, you cannot see too far from the picture of the day before. So if you wanna go beyond the line of sight, you have to drive autonomously. And so, you know, as I said, we, we've been driving on Mars autonomously for a while, but uh, we haven't used it very much because the driving distance uh, was not very long uh, in the previous missions. On MSL, actually, the average distance to drive per margin day, which is 24 hours and 40 minutes, was just at tens of meters, right? Uh, much slower than LA traffic. Uh, but in Mars 2020, um, we got to extend it to 150 to 200 meters per so, which is still very slow uh, compared to, you know, Earth-based driving, but it's very um, challenging for us. And because the line of sight doesn't extend, there's no choice but driving um, autonomously to extend the driving distance. That's why we need more capable um, autonomous driving in M2020. So here is a, a test uh, two years ago, I believe, in a place at JPL called Mars Yard. Uh, so 
you know, it, it, it uses the stereo vision to detect the uh, obstacles and it can avoid the rocks autonomously and it uh, uh, navigates itself to the specified goal. So, you know, uh, the driving on Mars has different challenges than driving, you know, uh, on Earth. Like there's no people or cars on Mars. I mean, if there are, that would be exciting, but uh, uh, we haven't found it yet. Um, however, there's no roads, signs, or GPS. Those are the difficult part. And, um, excuse me. Yeah, so another exciting aspect in the Mars 2020 uh, mission is that you're going to bring a tiny helicopter for the first time in the history. It's cool, right? Yes, it's very cool. Thank you. So going back to the uh, self-driving, I have to admit uh, we are much behind compared to the state of the art by, for example, Google or Uber. Uh, primarily because the limited computation power on board. But we are making improvement. And one thing that uh, uh, we've been doing at JPL is to enable deep learning based um, uh, perception for safely driving on Mars, like we are doing on Earth. So um, uh, humans typically use images to decide the routes on Mars, either from the rover or from the orbiter, right? And when people look at the pictures, you know, we look at both terrain type and topography. And however, what we are doing right now is only use the topography because the, um, the, 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 the autonomous driving on Mars solely relying on stereo vision, right? Uh, it only gives you the, the topography. So the upgrade that we are making is to use machine learning to visually identify the terrain type, whether it is a drivable sand, it's a hard rock, etc., etc. And for now, it is just a, 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 a ground capability for the same reason that uh, the Mars rover does not have a CPU to run the uh, deep net on board. Um, let me just skip that. Uh, however, uh, towards you know, as an intermediate step, we are um, uh, creating the uh, machine learning based terrain classification capability using a much um, weaker uh, computation, which we, what we call Spock light.
All right, that's me. <laughs> we have a more growing motivation for highly automating the rovers uh, because future rovers has to drive more extended distance, say kilometers per tow. So uh, for the sake of time, let me skip a few slides, uh, but going to here. So as I said, you know, as it drives further, it can collect more and more data, but the data capacity to send back to the Earth is limited. So what could happen? For example, you know, what we call the unnoticed green monster problem. Let's say Wolver just, you know, passes by something very interesting like green monster. But, you know, because it cannot send back the uh, image to Earth, uh, maybe we miss it. Um, or, even if we can send back many images, but scientists now having trouble processing vast volume of data manually. So we, we need some solution to that. And one of the solutions that we are producing is automated interpretation of the image in a scientific manner. So uh, in this example, these texts, is a one sentence explanation geological explanation of the images solely produced by machine learning. The way we did is that we basically ask scientists to produce thousands of captions for example images, and learn from it, and do some transfer learning to, to make it possible. So uh, I'll skip the uh, few things. So uh, those are for Mars, but we are not only uh, pursuing for Mars. We are looking at going further, for example, the moon of Jupiter called Europa. This is the uh, smallest of the uh, four Galilean moons. And you know, when Voyager 2 went there and took picture, something very peculiar uh, um, was found. Guess what? There's almost no craters here, right? On moon, on Mars, there are many craters. Why? Because this surface is continuously renewed like on Earth. So even if there are impacts, it's going to be quickly wiped away. So why is it renewed? Because this um, uh, tiny moon um, likely have an ocean below the ice shell. And there is, there's a tectonic uh, activity. And actually, the ocean of Europa, the subsurface ocean of Europa, has more water than Earth. The biggest ocean of, in the solar system is not on Earth, but in Europa. And many scientists um, thinks that this ocean could harbor life. And why this is exciting? Because, you know, if we find life on Europa or Mars, you know, we'll be able to answer a philosophical question that we've been asking for thousands of years. Are we alone? That's we are, what, why we are going there. So um, there's a one mission concept to go there go to the surface and uh, see if there's a biosignature called Europa Lander. Um, that is gonna be short-lived because the radiation environment is very harsh. Um, so there's no choice but uh, uh, highly automated to complete the mission within a short lifetime. So um, to, for this purpose, uh, we um, prototyped the autonomy algorithm, excuse me, the video doesn't play. Can you play the movie, please? Can you click? Yeah, can you click on the screen? Maybe it doesn't. No, 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 this slide is a movie, I believe. <laughs> sorry. Huh. OK, sorry, something is going wrong. Um, but that's fine. We're limited in time. Um, Another interesting destination uh, in the solar system is even smaller moon of Saturn called Enceladus. Um, it's again an icy moon, and when Cassini spacecraft um, observed from the orbit, it found plumes ejecting from the south polar region. And the plume turned out to be the water vapor. So now it's almost certain that uh, this tiny moon also has subsurface ocean, and there's this uh, crevasse that leads to um, the subsurface ocean. So this is an exciting place because there is already a natural opening down to the ocean. Therefore, we are now conceptualizing this kind of robot.
This robot is called Eels. A few meters long, the diameter is eight centimeters because the crevasse uh, could be as narrow as 10 cm. So the whole purpose of this robot is to um, go down to the liquid interface and sample the ocean, which may harbor life. So there's a life detection instrument uh, packaged in this snake robot. Uh, once it dives into water, it samples it and check if there is an indication of life. We don't uh, suspect there is a giant whale or fish, but uh, you know, maybe small bacteria could be there. All right, uh, sorry for going uh, over time. Let me summarize it. So, you know, um, as I showed you briefly, there are so many exciting opportunities for AI and machine learning and autonomy in general um, in space exploration. And I view this as an opportunity to give back to science. Because you know, since industrial revolution, technology has been basically the byproduct from science. But in space exploration, it's always been you know, that the science and technology is advanced hand in hand, where when new technologies become available, like you know, telescope or rocket or digital computer, it it enabled us to go to uh, you know to more distant places and make more discoveries. So you know, um, sometimes people ask questions, you know, why you want to spend billions of dollars to go to Mars or Europa to find uh, micro microbes. Uh, you know, it won't create any profits, you know, it won't make any poor people rich or rich people even richer. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this is something that I think myself. We call ourselves homo sapiens, which means man of knowledge. So the pursuit of knowledge, which is science, is probably a reason for existence of mankind. That's why we are doing this. Uh, so, thank you very much for listening. And lastly, uh, let me conclude my talk with Carl Sagan's quote, imagination will often carry us to words that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. And also, some self advertisement. If there are students here, probably not. Uh, I am looking for talents uh, to work with us. Uh, uh, so if you uh, are a professor, please uh, uh, you know, refer to your smart students to us. Thank you very much. That was amazing. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move into our last uh, part of the day. So there are sessions that will start momentarily actually downstairs, um, the last bit of sessions, and then you're gonna come back up here for the last panel. Um, and after that, we will, or for the keynote speaker, actually, John Tomic, and then the last panel, and then a reception for those who are not trying to get into traffic. Okay, so see you soon.